Good afternoon. Welcome to the Fundamentals of Construction Change Orders, a webinar brought to you by AIA Contract Documents. Before we get started, we're going to cover a few administrative items. Here's our uh, usual disclaimer from AIA Contract Documents that the program and accompanying materials are provided for informational purposes only. They are not provided as legal advice, so please confer with your own um, counsel. This presentation is protected by copyright laws, so reproduction, distribution, display, and use uh, is prohibited. This course is also registered with the AIA for one learning unit. When you registered for this course, um, you entered your AIA member ID if applicable, and we'll use that information to report your credit within the next two business weeks. So with that, I'm gonna now turn it over to the presenters to introduce themselves. Mark? Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today. I'm Mark Baum and I'm a sole practitioner and principal of my architectural consulting firm located in New Orleans focused on both private and public sector commercial and institutional work, and on providing peer review, process management, and construction administration consulting to emerging small firms. I'm in my 42nd year of architectural practice and have had the distinct privilege and pleasure to serve on the AI Documents Committee for the last five years. Val? Yes, thanks, Mark. Uh, good day, everyone. Thanks for joining us in this uh, important discussion. My name is Sal Verastro. I'm with Spillman Farmer Architects, a small firm in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. I'm the technical managing principal here. Um, I've been here for 40 years, and I've been on the um, the uh, documents committee, AI contract documents committee, for nine, this is my ninth year. Um, we mainly do um, both public and private um, uh, architectural work with interior design. Let me, next slide, let me start off with a very quick um, note from our, obviously our sponsor, the AA Contract Documents, just a real quick, I'll, I won't spend much time on this. The AA Contract Documents program has been a long-standing um, program with a lot of history. I've been publishing documents since 1888. Um, the reason I tell you that is that uh, it, we've created uh, legal standard forms uh, to help make the design and construction transactions more predictable, and that's what this is all about. Um, we offer more than 200 documents and agreements. Um, the, the key thing here to remember is the widespread use and the volume of case history is unprecedented. Um, and that's why these documents are used so often. We'll be referencing them, of course. And, and the bottom line here is we use these, these contract documents um, for allocating risk to the party who's best uh, available to manage uh, and control that risk. And this is uh, the, con the uh, what we're going to be talking about today uh, with change orders is obviously a, a part of risk. Uh, this is a very risky business. So next slide is our learning objectives. Um, we're going to talk about um, understanding the, the, the causes and impacts of change orders on your projects. We're going to talk about applying some best, best practices and preparing when you prepare a change order. And we're gonna talk deeply about determining which party is responsible for the impact of that change order, and in particular, our standard of care as architects. And then Mark's gonna uh, do a little demonstration on uh, completing an AIA G701 change order document. Um, and so he's gonna take care of that at the end of this program. So let me turn it back to Mark to talk about change orders. So, how does the A201 general conditions of the contract for construction address modifications to the contract? The term change order is found 23 times in the text of the 2017 version of the A201. In its first paragraph, under the definition of the contract documents, the A201 immediately outlines four means by which the contract for construction may be modified, including one, a written amendment to the contract, this would typically involve changes to the terms and conditions of the contract prepared by either party that are not directly relative to the work of the contract and do not necessarily involve the architect. Two, a change order, which is the subject of today's webinar. Three, a construction change directive, which we'll briefly discuss later. And four, 
a written order for a minor change in the work. Typically, this is in the form of an Architect's Supplemental Instructions, or ASI. Next. The webinar, this webinar focuses on the change order, which is defined in Section 7.2 of the A201 as follows. A change order is a written instrument prepared by the architect and signed by the owner, contractor, and architect, stating their agreement upon all of the following, the change in the work, the amount of the adjustment, if any, in the contract sum, and the extent of the adjustment, if any, in the contract time. Before we get into the details of the change order, Sal will discuss the cause and impacts of change orders on the project. Sal? Thank you, Mark. So a little footnote before we get started. Um, this is an entry-level presentation, and uh, but we can expand upon that foundation anytime with questions towards the end, which we hope you'll have. Um, on the lighter side of thing, a change order or the term change order has been given a very bad rap in recent years, I'd say the last 10 or 15, 20 years. It's perceived by most people in our industry as negative, a very bad thing. Why? And I have often wondered that. Some of it is certainly justified. Most of it is not justified in my opinion. A, a, a change order is just an extension of the contract, which is generally signed, well, it has to be signed by both parties or all the parties. And it's memorializing that change, which Mark is going to talk about a little bit later. Even if it's at no cost, it could be a no cost change order, but we need to document the change. Um, and I've often wondered why is a change order so perceived as negative? And, and is it the word change? Because nobody likes changes, right? So that may be a negative connotation. And then the other thing was uh, maybe it's the word the action word, which is an order, because no one likes to take orders. So maybe we, we got to think about changing the change order term because it's always it bothers people. It's perception only, as I've I said it lightheartedly, joking. But so let's talk about the causes and impacts of change orders. Let's examine what might cause a change order and the poten potential impact. As we run through this presentation, keep a keep a mental track of those changes and ask yourself: Is that a negative? negative change to the contract. So on the screen you'll see we're going to start off with owner directed changes that often happen and what are they? So um, the, the owner could change the scope of our of the contract construction contract. This is all during construction of course um, with uh, uh, upgrades that they decide to take upon themselves or if they're you know, for example a tenant fit out all of a sudden you're working on a building and a, a tenant comes in and wants to fit it out and add it to your contract. Pretty easy scope changes. Um, to all positive things. The schedule, um, the owner could add milestone dates that were um, that we were unaware of in the beginning, including the contractor, uh, lease obligations or from tenant openings, and those things would affect the schedule and therefore it, it affects the change order mostly under the construction side, but it also can affect us as well as designers. Um, and, and if you look at the AA201, um, and it's specifically paragraph 2.5, owner's right to carry out the work, um, that this can also cause potential change orders to the contractor. There may be cause for the contractor if the owner engages a separate contractor um, during construction, uh, because the owner has the right to, to, to uh, obviously carry out the work. But uh, if, if, if it affects the contractor's schedule in any way or um, impedes him in any way, the contractor has a right to request a change order. Um, and then the last one typically that we see is if an owner has an objection to a sub or supplier. Typically this happens at contract signing, but it could happen during construction uh, for whatever reason. And if either the architect or the owner has a reasonable object objection, they could ask the contractor, the general contractor or the prime contractor to replace that subcontractor and that would and it may be more uh, costly for the contractor to bring in a different sub and that is a result in a change order that the owner would have to incur by the contract. So these are real simple ones and again they don't necessarily have to be negative they could be a positive thing. The next slide we're going to talk about more common reasons for a change order and these are obviously unforeseen conditions and many of us have seen these uh, numerous times in our careers. Uh, the first one is obviously the mo one of the most common ones, differing site conditions or 
concealed, the first two, concealed conditions, unknown conditions, um, subsurface uh, conditions, you hit rock, unsuitable soil, things like that. The AIA 201 general conditions in paragraph 3.7.4 uh, it delineates in detail how this is supposed to be ha happening. Um, by the way, mold's another example. If you're doing an existing building, any kind of hidden pipes that you, when you expose uh, the, the guts of a wall that may come up, these are all a legitimate change order request by a contractor, and, and it may affect us as well. Um, Requirements of the authority having jurisdiction. Uh, they, they, there are times when there are changes in the, the permit re at a permit review, what we were unaware of, or retroactive changes in the law that has happened or ordinances that happens that impacts the project. And this could happen, um, of course, uh, if and we're talking about during construction now, most of the time or after the contract signing. Um, these the, uh, code officials can interpret things a little differently, and we've all experienced that. Well, those are legitimate change order requests, particularly if we had no reason to or, or, or knowledge of those particular changes. Uh, discovery of hazardous material, I mentioned that before about mold, but it also could be obviously the, the, the one in recent years has been both asbestos and lead paint. Uh, many, many times that it comes up where they were, it was, it was not unknown when these things are dis discovered um, and have to be dealt with. There's a, obviously a reason for a change order, and those are also covered in the uh, AI 201 in, in paragraph 10.3.2 for your own delineation. Um, the next slide, we're going to talk about the delays beyond the contractor's control, um, legitimate change orders. Uh, and some of the ones we've already talked about were certainly out, out, out of their control. But uh, the, the, the common ones are listed on the screen here, um, acts of the neglect by both the owner and the architect or maybe a separate subcontractor by the owner uh, that we mentioned a couple before that will cause the delays or extensions of time. And in AIA 201, paragraph 8.3, delays and an extension of time, it gives a a very nice description on what the contractor, what the steps they have to take and what are allowed. But um, these are, you know, for an example is, and I'll, and I'll pick on the architects for a while because I'm one, design, our design intent wasn't reasonably inferred and the contractor didn't understand something very clearly and, and that's beyond his control, his or her control. Um, we specified a product that's no longer available contractor has a right to um, substitute another product and if it's additional cost to the owner uh, so be it um, we will talk about design error errors and emissions shortly so I'll, I'll pause on that one uh, product I mentioned product substitutions uh, even if it's a cost savings uh, which would be a change order by the way and it could be a cost that's not always a negative uh, excuse me a negative cost for the owner it could be a positive cost where contractor or the architect or the owner comes across a product that's much uh, better suited for the particular application um, or if we learn new information about a specified product that came along we can certainly implement that um, all these things that are mentioned here uh, are covered uh, in, in the process in the general conditions but they're again out of the contractors control and legitimate reasons for change orders so let's move on to um, uh, the architect standard of care, which we mentioned earlier. Um, and I, I'm just going to read this for one second because it's really important. This is a basis of a lot of litigation um, that protects architects. The architect shall perform its services consistent with the professional care, excuse me, skill and care ordinary, ordinarily provided by architects practicing in the same or similar locality under the same and similar circumstances. This is what, this is what we get judged by in our contract are the, strictly the B01 here, B101, um, for errors, emissions, um, and obviously conflicts. And there's a big difference. This is a universal legal requirement, which all design professionals are judged by. It's very, very important to know, to know this. But there's a difference between errors and emissions. An error is issued, uh, issues where that are require modifications to work already in place. Um, the wall is that we, we designed the wall or a door or whatever it is in the wrong location. It has to be torn out and moved. That's an error. An omission is added scope not provided for in the contract documents, but required to be completed 
for the, the for the success of the project. Uh, we missed a beam. Uh, we didn't show it. It has to be added. Things like that. Um, or a door. We missed a door, for example, or a, a, a specific door that no one noticed. Things like that. Those are omissions, and those can be added. And the owner didn't pay for it in the first place. And and those are the ones we we you know we. We often refer back to clients don't like to hear it, owners don't like to hear it, but that's reality. We're not perfect, and our documents aren't perfect. No one ever said they, they are, but some mistakes do happen. Errors, uh, that's that's debatable. Um, if, if we're responsible for it, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, who's responsible. And conflicts or inconsistencies in the contract documents, potentially, potentially giving rise to a contractor's claim um, where we, we show one thing on one drawing and it's different on another, or, our, or one of our consultants, a, stru a structural engineer, showed one thing, something one way, and we didn't pick it up. Um, those are conflicts, and those have to be resolved. It's not necessarily an error; they can be resolved. They may or may not be more money or less money, depending on the application. So, um, let's move to the changes uh, to the contract terms. Um, on the next slide, we mentioned substitutions. Uh, the big question is, do we get paid for a substitution request during construction? And, and, and the AIA 201 clearly defines that we should be getting reimbursed for our time. Uh, it depends on how you wrote your contract with, with your owner. But um, again, we always try to be the nice guy and help the owner out, but we have to be careful on those kind of things. Uh, changes to insurance requirements. Um, this happens quite often where, um, an owner f fails to purchase the required insurance, or they lapse, or they cancel, and that that uh, presents a problem. That could potentially be a change order, and and those have to be dealt with. This is mainly on the owner's side. Uh, settlement of insured loss, um, losses due to, for example, a fire, a storm, theft on the job site, things like that. Um, those are potential change orders. Um, to if if um, particularly the insurance wasn't properly set up. Now, those kind of things happen very infrequently, but they do happen. And the most common ones um, that are uh, defined in the contract terms are, and I will lump them together, but allowances and unit prices. Um, these, these change orders, for let's take an allowance. You have an allowance on a project, you don't use all the allowance, and there's money left over in the allowance. How do you allocate or do the accounting on that? Well, typically we do it at the end of the project. I prefer to do it at substantial completion and not at final completion, but you can do it at either one. Uh, you're, you, what you're really doing is finalizing and resolving the accounting of that allowance. And it could be more. Maybe you used up all the allowance and there's additional cost. That can happen typically at the end of the project where you consolidate all those allowances. Pretty much the same thing with unit prices associated with allowances usually you reconcile them at substantial completion, um, but it, again, it could be at um, um, final completion if you'd like. And I just I point we point these out because these are these are change orders that are not necessarily negative. It's just a matter of the processing of the contract, uh, and it, they may or may not involve adjustments in in, in uh, cost or time, but they have to be allocated um, and rectified at the end of the project. Um, and in the next slide, we want to talk about closeout adjustments to the contract. So um, things that can wait to the substantial completion to close out. We mentioned a couple of these before. If there were weather delays and contract time has to be extended, which costs the contractor time and money, and it may also affect us as, as architects, by the way. Um, we mentioned the allowances in unit prices. These are all closeout adjustments. Um, if there's uh, material testing back charges that occurred during construction, this is the time to to do that. And we've all heard about liquidated damages, and I and I wanted to mention early completion bonuses as well. If there's if the contractor gets done in time and there's a bonus uh, clause in the in the documents, this is the time to do it. Or if there's liquidated damages at substantial completion. Um, although you would have had already notified the contractor about these potential damages before this, but this is when you re reconcile them uh, um, when the project is substantially complete. And also, if and I'm sure you're, you all um, have done punch lists before, of there may be some unsatisfactory work that was done by the contractor, but the owner accepted it. So there's a credit due back to the owner for uh, work that was not satisfactory completed in the eyes of the owner. And, and ourselves. So, but this is, uh, again, all these things are done pretty much at the end of the project and substantial completion is what we're recommending. 
All right, let's talk about the impacts. Uh, what are the impacts on a project on our next slide? Um, well, first and foremost, it's the, it's the cost, the project cost. It could be a negative and it could be a positive. Uh, there could be a change order that benefits the owner in dollars and cents, and it could be additional cost. Or it could be no change in all, but as I mentioned before, you should always write a uh, change order uh, just to document and memorialize that change. And it could be just time, a time extension. Um, the schedule, and if it is that, if it is a, a schedule, time schedule, then uh, these are the most difficult to assess, by the way, uh, how it affects the schedule. But um, so we have to be very diligent about that if it, it really it did impact the, the critical path on the project. But this is the, this is how it would impact the project, a change order. Uh, but more importantly, I think um, strained relationships. Um, change orders tend to cause uh, if they're contested or questionable, if they're not clear cut, there's not enough backup information, it does strain relationships between the parties quite often. And more so if there's a lot of change orders on a project, there's a lot of RFIs and a lot of changes, the morale on the project site and the performance tends to uh, take a negative uh, effect on the project, particularly if there's time extensions uh, or reworking of um, uh, the work that was installed where you had to, uh, morale is absolutely reduced when there's numerous changes where you have to rip things out and rebuild. Um, it, it's just it's just the way it is. Contractors don't like it and they tend to um, take a negative connotation to it. The quality work suffers. There's no question about it. Statistics show the quality work um, by disgruntled workers is affected uh, by numerous change orders. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Mark, and he's going to talk about best practices. Thank you, Sal. Next slide, please. First and foremost, it's important to clearly understand the difference between a construction change directive and a change order. <clears throat> As defined by the A201, a construction change directive is a written order prepared by the architect and signed by both the owner and architect directing a change in the work prior to agreement on adjustment, if any, in the contract sum or contract time or both. The A201 states, a construction change or directive shall be used in the absence of total agreement on the terms of a change order. The construction change directive or CCD directs the, chain, the contractor to immediately commence additional work or to implement a change in the work. This tool may be used where the owner and contractor have not agreed on proposed changes in the contract sum or the contract time, or to direct changes in the work, which if not expeditiously implemented might delay the project. The CCD is signed by the owner and the architect and is valid even if the contractor does not sign. Next click. On the other hand, the change order represents a complete and final agreement between the owner and contractor, including agreement on the scope of the change and on any adjustments in the contract sum and contract time. Now, just to re for repetition, as change order is a written instrument prepared by the architect and signed by the owner, contractor, and architect stating their agreement upon all of the following, the change in the work, the amount of the adjustment, if any, in the contract sum, and the extent of the adjustment, if any, in the contract time. To reiterate, the key difference is that a CCD directs a change, while a change order is a settled agreement between the owner and contractor. Typically, both documents will be first signed by the architect, indicating that it is an agreement and has knowledge of the changes directed in the work, as well as the changes in the contract sum and contract time. For a CCD, the architect and owner will sign and it will then be sent to the contractor for its signature. The contractor may elect to sign it or not, but it must proceed with the work. For a change order, it is signed by the architect and then by the contractor. It is then sent to the owner for its signature. Even though the architect is not a party to the construction contract, it is required by section 721 of the A201 to sign these documents. Next. <clears throat> There are processes leading to a change order. These documents, the documents created in these processes will ultimately become the supporting document, documentation for the change order. A proposal request, 
is issued by the architect to the contractor requesting a proposal for a change or for an increase or reduction in the scope of the contract. The AIA document G709 is available for this purpose. A proposal request is typically issued by the architect on behalf of the owner or by the architect on its own volition to determine the cost of a change it may be contemplating or that may be required to properly perform the work. A request for information is initiated by the contractor for clarification of the contract documents, to which the architect will then respond. The architect must be very careful in its response to assure that it is grounded in the contract documents, referencing specification provisions or applicable information on the drawings, and its response does not inadvertently direct added work to be performed on the project. To the extent that the RFI response requires a change in the work of the contract, the architect should prepare a proposal request seeking the cost and time impact for the required change. The architect's supplementary, supplemental instructions, ASI, is a directive issued by the architect to the contractor providing additional information within the scope of the contract documents or to direct minor changes in the work that, in the architect's opinion, will not result in adjustment in the contract sum or contract time. The AI document G710 is for this purpose. The construction change directive is also a document preceding the change order and serves as supporting documentation as the scope of work directed by the CCD and its cost and schedule impact must ultimately be formally included in the contract by change order. The contractor's change order request or COR or proposed change order PCO, depending on which term the contractor chooses to use, is a proposal issued by the contractor either as a self-initiated claim or in response to the architect's proposal request. The contractor may also submit a COR or PCO if in the contractor's opinion, the architect's response to an RFI or an ASI issued by the architect modifies the scope of the contract. The contractor's COR or PCO is not a change order. That proposal should include a few items that are critical. A thorough and detailed breakdown in documentation of costs and credits for labor, materials, and equipment in sufficient detail to facilitate the architect and engineer's review for reasonableness. To include an explanation of all costs and credits describing the scope of the work involved and other work of the contract that may be impacted by the proposed change. You have, should have an explanation of all schedule impacts, if any, and provide all the supporting documentation, such as support, subcontractor and supplier quotes, receipts, schedule fragments, documentation of burden rates, et cetera. Next. <clears throat> Once the contractor's COR or PCO is received, the architect is obligated to review it. First, does the scope of the contractor's proposal accurately reflect the proposed change in the scope of the contract? Is it complete? Does it appear that the contractor understands the proposed change? Are the material quantities correct? Do labor hours appear to be appropriate? First, the architect well, excuse me, I know what I said first, but anyway, the architect must confirm that the contractor is not asserting a claim for work that is already required of the contract documents. It is not uncommon for a contractor to submit a claim for costs which it already is obligated or in the contractor's interpretation of the documents believes additional work is involved. It is the architect's responsibility for H A201 general conditions to interpret and decide matters concerning the requirements of the contract documents. So you key here is, is that you really need to assure that everything the contractor is proposing is legitimate, is not an already an obligation of him to perform under his contract, and that the costs are reasonable. So typically the architect is not required by contract with the owner to perform a detailed cost estimate, but rather to assure that the owner the owner that in the architect's professional judgment, the costs presented are reasonable, including applied labor, burden rates, and other factors. The architects and its engineers review should confirm that quantities are correct and the costs presented are allowed by contract. 
This might include comparing with other similar proposals to see if the contractor and subs are providing equitable credits and deducts. For example, are credits for similar work in this and other change proposals priced similarly to added costs? One example that I like to give, um, I see quite often, um, are equipment rates. Sometimes you have equipment that's already mobilized on the project, but the contractor is asking for additional days for that piece of equipment or additional hours or weeks, whatever the case may be. Sometimes they'll present a cost at a daily rate, which is far more expensive than a weekly rate or monthly rate. They should be only charging at the rate in which they're leasing the equipment. So for example, if they have a piece of lift equipment on the job site throughout several months, but they need this for this change order as well, they should only be charging a pro rata share of that to the change. Further, the architect should disallow costs such as home office overhead expenses that may already be included in the contractor's allowed overhead and profit percentage. Your contract should def define what is included. General conditions costs should only be allowed if the critical path of the schedule is impacted. So if the, the general conditions costs are directly related to the time and uh, money spent while the contractor is on site, generally on a daily basis. So if yeah, you're not extending the schedule, there should not be anything uh, under general conditions that is added to it unless it's specific to the change. And sometimes such costs are prohibited by contract. The architect must be familiar with the costs that the contract does allow. Contractors are typically not required to credit overhead and profit on deductive change orders, except where the change includes added or deductive costs where overhead is then only calculated on the net increase in cost. Now schedule. As architects, we are typically not experienced or proficient in analyzing schedule logic, nor do most architects have subscriptions to sophisticated <coughs> scheduling software. However, as an architect, you should be able to determine if the schedule impact is reasonable. Does the contractor provide an explanation for any claim delay? Most important, does the proposed change impact the schedule's critical path, or can the additional work be performed concurrent with work currently under contract? If so, there should not be an increase in contract time. Also, could the contract mitigate delays by adjusting other activities? Are there concurrent delays that are already the responsibility of the contractor? Bottom line is that a change to the contract is not a free pass to erase unrelated or ongoing schedule issues. Then you may not, you may be at an impasse as to where, what the cost or time impact are. And if so, if you're not in full agreement with the contractor's proposal, the architect must promptly respond to the contractor, detailing the reasons for disagreement. Then proceed to negotiate as needed to reach an equitable agreement. Also, if the costs presented are not acceptable, you might engage with the contractor and its subcontractors closely to explore alternative approaches that may be more cost effective and achieve a similar or acceptable result. Then finally, once an agreement, when, next click, once an agreement with the contractor's proposal, visit with the owner to explain the cost for the change, review the cost and time impacts, and seek owner approval of the proposed adjustments of the scope, the contract sum, and the contract time. So once all parties are in agreement, begin preparing the change order. <clears throat> Fully describe the changes. The description of the change should be clear, succinct, and complete. It does not need to repeat all the details contained in the supporting documentation, but should be adequately described for a third party to generally understand the nature of the changes and its impacts. There are three parts to the description which coincide with the definition of the change order, the change in the work or scope, the impact on cost and the impact on time. I like to separate these when I write the change order, and I'll go review this a little bit more in part four where we're talking about um, preparing the change order itself in the, um, in the um, document service. For the scope, summarize the change and reference the specific contract documents that are being changed, as well as the documents prepared and issued by the architect that describe and detail the change, such as the proposal requests and ASIs. For cost and time, 
state the total of the contract's proposed change in the contract sum and in the contract time as per the accepted contract proposal. The point here is that you want to rely on the architect's documents to define scope, and you want to rely on the contractor's proposal to define cost and time. You don't want to rely on the contractor's proposal for scope, as they may there may be some variations in what he is saying and may create interpretation issues between the two documents. Change orders should also be written to document changes in the, in the contract, even when there is no change to the contract sum or contract time. Multiple change items may be included in a single change order. Uh, next slide, please. After describing the change and the impacts of the contract sum and contract time, list all the attachments. The attachments include each of the documents that precede the preparation of the change order, and which become the supporting documents for the change order. Several are by the architect, or can be, request for information, an ASI, an architect supplementary instructions, a construction change directive, a proposal request, and new and revised drawings and specifications that may be attached to that proposal request or, or to any of the other uh, documents. Then also documents by the contractor, obviously their change order request or proposed change order. And then all the documentation that they're going to provide attached to that for costs and schedule impacts. <clears throat> you should list each attachment referenced in the scope description and any other relevant attachments with the date of the attachment behind it. I find that it's good practice to list the documents in reverse order of their creation with the most recent document listed first, which is typically the contractor's change proposal. This will allow a third party to readily understand the timeline of communications and documents that led to the change. Next click. Finalize, then finalize it. Of course, we want to then compile all the attachments and issue with the change order. Once the change order is finalized, it's common to print in triplicate, one original for each signatory. The architect typically signs first, followed by the contractor, then by the owner. Alternatively, if the parties agree, all can be handled electronically in PDF form and signed electronically. I'm gonna turn it back to Sal for a couple slides to discuss the resp how responsibility for the change amongst the parties may be determined. Sal? Yes, thank you, Mark. Um, so the, the following uh, comments from Mark and I are generally, they apply to design, bid, build, project delivery method but they can also apply to other project delivery methods as well, but we're, we're strictly going to stay in the design build, build market. Next slide. So I'm going to, I'm going to take um, the owner and the contractor's responsibility and talk to you about that. And then Mark's going to take the ar architect's responsibility. Um, and we're, we're basing this, this presentation on the contract language, not necessarily our opinions. I'm going to start with the, uh, well, the owners on the screen. We'll start with that. Um, the owner is responsible, and when we say responsible, we're talking about paying for, uh, financially responsible for the items that we list here. We talked about some of these before. Any costs associated with changes uh, for any di owner-directed changes, whether it's the schedule or scope, they certainly are responsible for those change orders. We mentioned unforeseen conditions through no one's fault um, there was an unforeseen condition. The owner is responsible for that. It's clearly defined in the contract. Certainly matters out of the contractor's control. As we mentioned before, it is the owner's responsibility to pay for those things, whether they like it or not. Um, surely it could impact the bottom line, but that's just that's the risk involved. We were in a risky business here, and um, um, it has to be handled that way. Mark's going to talk about. Uh, air, architects, owners, and uh, excuse me, errors and emissions in a second. But I, I just wanted to mention here, Mark's going to get into this in detail. But uh, the standard of care, uh, it's under the standard of care. It's ultimately the owner's responsibility to pay for the owner, excuse me, the architect's error and emissions. If we miss something, the owner has to pay for it. Mark's going to talk about that in more detail in a second. With respect to the contractor's responsibility, which is the next slide. There's actually only two items, uh, main two items, mainly two items that the contractor is responsible for. The substitutions, which a, a contractor is responsible for um, 
paying for maybe the substitution request and, and review. Um, if it costs the owner more or less money, then that would be their responsibility. But um, we, we have the, the savings must be presented, if there are savings, must be presented to the owner for review. Actually, we, they'll send it to us as the architect. We represent the owner. But the GC must verify that this, the substitutions are equal and equitable. That's their responsibility before it even comes in. Um, we're a secondary resource and, and reviewing party on this one. Um, the, the, um, uh, as Mark kind of mentioned before, the contractor must provide strong and deliberate language to determine the cost of that substitution request as it relates to a change order. The, uh, a contractor cannot arbitrarily overcharge or undercharge the owner in a credit situation. We as the architect must be vigil vigilant in defending and protecting the owner in this situation and at the same time being fair to the contractor. That's our, our responsibility uh, in this contract. I'm gonna turn it back to Mark and he's gonna talk about uh, the the architect's liability in this case and responsibility. Thank you, Sal. As previously discussed, there are many reasons why a change order may be required, including owner-directed changes, differing site conditions, sealed building conditions, requirements of authorities having jurisdiction, among others. In certain instances, the architect, along with his consultants, may also be responsible to the owner to cover the cost of a change. Subject to the architect's standard of care, set forth in the architect's agreement with the owner. And I think it were, it's worth repeating. The architect shall perform its services consistent with the professional skill and care ordinarily provided by architects practicing in the same or similar loc locality under the same or similar circumstances. The architect shall perform its services as expeditiously as is consistent with such professional skill and care in the orderly progress of the project. This is the, the language found in the AB 101. The language in your contracts could vary if they're not following the B 101, but it's something to be very careful about when negotiating your contracts as to changing that because it also could affect your insurance coverage. But what this means is that the architect is not expected to be perfect, but also is not expected to be negligent or untimely in performing its services either. Change orders should be expected, not all due to the architect. The owner should expect some degree of change and have reasonable contingencies set aside for change orders that may arise for any of the reasons mentioned. Change orders arising out of the architect's performance may be due to either an error or an omission in its documents. Errors are defined as generally as issues that require modification to work in place or other matters that result in added costs or time to the project that would not have otherwise been incurred. Omissions typically involve added scope not provided in the contract documents, but, but it is required to complete the project. The owner, however, is not entitled to what we call betterment. What is betterment? If the required change provides for added scope that the owner has not yet paid for, the owner is responsible for that cost. In other words, they're not entitled to get value from the architect or contractor. As some say, the owner must pay for the project once. The architect and contractor, neither of which will enjoy the benefits of profits or, um, or use of the completed project, are not responsible for buying any part of that project for the owner. The architect, however, may be held responsible by the owner for any premiums to add scope or make changes to the project due to the architect's error or omission compared to what that work might have otherwise cost had it been originally included in the bid documents. Similarly, the contractor may be held responsible for certain costs it fails to, if it fails to mitigate increases in costs that are within its reasonable control. Next page, please. There are two other important items to note. The architect does not pay for the change order directly. Sal touched on this. The architect and its consultants are never directly responsible to the contractor for the impact of a change, but rather are responsible to the owner. Therefore, the, con the change order document does not include any provision for the architect to pay the cost directly to the contractor. 
Why? Because the architect is not a party to the contract for construction and therefore responsibility for the impact of the change order is solely a matter between the owner and the architect. The second item, please click, is withholding costs from the architect's fee. <clears throat> AIB 101, 2017, Section 1110, 2.2 states, the owner shall not withhold amounts from the architect's compensation to impose a penalty or liquidated damages on the architect or to offset sums requested by or paid to contractors for the cost of changes in the work unless the architect agrees or has been found liable for the amounts in a binding dispute resolution proceeding. The architect may agree to, to pay for all or part of a change due to its error or omission. That's a business decision. In the case where the parties do not agree, the owner must then make a claim against the architect. The architect then may engage its professional liability insurer to defend the claim and pay the claim if the architect is found to be liable. And this is to be very this is very important. If the architect agrees to offset its fee, its insurer may not provide coverage and the architect may not be able to recover its loss. So if you have language in your contract that says the owner can assess claims against the fee, that is generally is not coverable by your insurance, uh, from my understanding. So we will now demonstrate how to complete the AI change order form in the AI documents online service. We're going to have to switch over here. Host, if you can give me access, um, I'll allow to share my screen, please. Okay. So let's see. Okay, sorry, I'm going to have to log in here. While he's doing that, Hosti, we will be taking questions after Mark uh, completes this, correct? That is correct. Okay. Okay. So Great. I believe my, sh my screen should be visible. And so we've set up a project here called um, AI Documents Committee. This is on the home page. And what I want to do first is we have, we already established, already set up a form to look at, but I want to show <clears throat> how we do this. So um, we're going to go to the uh, project page and then we want to be able to create a document. And so we're going to, so we don't have to look through 200 documents. We're going to say filter by the word change. And it comes up with about six or seven documents that are related to the word change. And the top one here is our change order. So we can either Click on the template name, which will open it in the software. Or if you want to edit online, you can go over here and do that and put it into your desktop. But we're just going to do it in this service here. So they'll have a pop-up box that will come up here, and it'll you'll just hit OK and open it. I'm not going to do that right now, but I just wanted to show you how that worked. Um, and then if you have a previous change order, you can hit Import From, and you can pick a previous change order. But I'm going to cancel out of that for a moment. And then I just want to open up this document, which is our uh, G701-2017 form draft 001. And under document name, you click on it. You don't want to hit finalize at this point. And this opens up the document in the uh, software here. Um, so here you should be all pre-populated. The, the top section with all the project information may be pre-populated based on the information that you've already incorporated into your project in the AI documents software. Um, but you do want to make sure it's all correct and all the names are correct and everything. And then you also want to make sure the change order number is correct and the date of the change order is correct. Next, we get into the body of the change. And this is where I want to speak to you a little bit about how I like to put these together. And you can take it or leave it or, uh, or, or use this format if you wish. As I mentioned before, <clears throat> we, I break this down into about three, well, well three parts basically. The first part is, furnish, is describing the change. Furnish all labor materials and equipment. And then you want to insert a summary of the change 
in accordance with the documents that the architect has issued, issued by the architect and the date. Secondly, you're going to say what the adjustments to the contract sum and contract time are, and that shall be in accordance with the contractor's change order request or proposed change order, again, whatever they choose to call it, dated whatever the date is. I then summarize each change in the document with a line that just has add, deduct, or whatever, the, the amount to and from the contract sum, and the add, deduct, or no change to the contract time. I've shown two entries here, uh, two items of change, and the second one I kind of filled it out to see what that looks like. Um, so in this case, it would say furnish all labor materials to provide terrazzo flooring in lobby 100 in lieu of polished concrete. So that may be an up, uh, increase in the quality that the owner is requesting. In accordance with the architect issued proposal request 01 to obtain pricing, the date, and they issued sheet A2.1 to define the change, maybe show the control joints and the pattern, et cetera, et cetera. And then we write the second element of this is, well, what's the contract time and contract sum changes? So you have adjustments to the contract sum and contract time shall be in accordance with the contractor's change order request, COR02, dated December 1st. And then summarize that by add the amount, I'm thinking it was $50,000 to the contract sum and seven days to the time. Then I'll usually put a total of all the items in the change order in bold and say, you know, total for change order one. And this will be, this will be copied down here as well. Um, add 50,000 to the contract sum uh, and probably you have to make sure you get it correct, which I didn't hear. You want to say that it's seven days to the contract time. So we would edit that by simply clicking on the uh, edit button here. Um, then add your attachments. And simply here, I just grabbed them from up here. Change order request COR dated 12-1 and put that attachment here, listed it here, and grab the proposal request and listed it here, and sheet A2.1 listed it. So that's as simple as that. But this is a this works well for me, and I think it follows the, the terminology in the contract. Next, we get to the summary section, <clears throat> and it gives you two options. There's several items here that you can open or close the. Uh, uh, pull down menus here. Contract sum is the most common for a design bid build project, but sometimes you may have a guaranteed maximum price. So under contract sum, you'll see some of these lines say the contract sum is in the is in the language. When you change this, it automatically changes this to contract to guaranteed maximum price in those line items. But we're working with a contract sum. In this case, the contract was a million dollars. Previously, this is the first change order, so there are no change orders um, involved. <clears throat> the contract sum prior to this change order was still a million dollars. If there was a previous change order, let's say there was $50, you would put that in and it would automatically total in this third line as to $50. But we don't have a previous one, so we're going to go back to that. Then the next line is you're going to increase, decrease, or the contract sum will remain unchanged. In this case, we had a $50,000 increase, and therefore the next line says the total will be $1,050,000. If we decreased it, you don't put a negative over here. You put It just stays $50,000, but it says decreased, and you can see how this number automatically changed. If it's unchanged, it doesn't total this amount, but obviously you want to go in here and put a zero because you don't want to leave it um, saying 50,000. Um, but but we're, going to inc we're increasing about 50,000. The contract time then will be increased, decreased or unchanged, same, same pull down. But this doesn't self-calculate, so you'll have to just you just type in seven days. And if let's say the previous substantial completion date was June 23rd, this adds seven days to it, so the new date is now June 30th. So it's as simple as that. Then there's a note in here that says the change order does not include adjustments to the contract sum or guaranteed maximum price or the contract time. 
that have been authorized by the construction change directive until that time has been in, in cost has been agreed to by the owner and contractor, et cetera, et cetera. You can edit this note, you can delete the note, you can do whatever you want as it may be appropriate for your project or for your change order. Um, then the final thing is the uh, signature lines and um, just make sure all the information is correct to suggest that you make sure that the folks signing the change order are those that are authorized by their companies to enter, to enter into contracts because it is a change to the contract. And then I usually put the date that I'm initiating it and signing it, but I usually leave off the dates for the um, for the folks in uh, the, con the construction firm and the owner, because I don't know exactly what date they're gonna be signing it. So that finalizes it, make sure you save. And then I'll usually do a print preview to see what it looks like to make sure it uh, makes sense. I don't know how your browser works, but mine pops it up there. And then you can look at it to see how it looks. I usually won't do the print so large, but I did that in this case, so that's easy for you all to read and see what it looks like. So that's pretty much how you create it. I wanna go back one, do one more thing to show you. Now, if you back where I was, so for example, now you wanted to, you have change order one, it's completed. Um, you wanna create change order two, you go back to create document again, find the change order. And in this case, now you want to import information from the previous because you want all, all that information to be the same. You don't have to recreate it. And then you hit OK. And your new change order document comes up and it's clean. So you don't have anything in the, uh, in the um, description la language in here. You'll have to add that. But it automatically says change order two. You have to add the date. And what's important here, it automatically takes that number from this line and moves it to the previous change order lines, 50,000, and shows that the current um, contract value is $1,050,000. So that's where you stood after change order one. And it automatically does that for you. You do have to also add your dates down here, but everything else should be the same. So that completes um, this review in the document service. I'm gonna turn that back over to Hosti now, and um, she will then take it to conclusion and I'll open up for questions. Okay, hello everybody, and thank you to Mark and Sal um, for providing that excellent presentation. If you have any questions um, after today's webinar about any of our contract documents, you can uh, send them over to docinfo at aiacontracts.com. So again, thanks to all for joining in and participating in today's webinar.